The Square Ball Podcast. Hello there and welcome to the show. It's brought to you in association with Levi Solicitors, who will do you a 10% discount on your legal fees at levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. Or Michael Normanton at home with your injured poorly back. Tell them the good bit. 15% off on the big three if you go and listen to the Phil Hay Monday Club and get the code off of that. So you have delivered that in the best way you've done all season, all year. Because I'm getting the hang of it. Just because you're in, it's the comfort of your own home, isn't it? You crumble in the mm. work environment. When the pressure gets to you, you just can't deliver. Well, maybe the work environment is toxic. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you want to have a, a little look at yourself for that. <laughs> if you are having problems at work, by the way, some employment law and so on and so forth, levislisters.co.uk forward slash the square ball. Moscow White's here as well. Daniel Chapman completing the uh, the triumvirate and we are doing part two of the relegation special now where we're going to be a little bit more players focused uh we need to get on to deciding what we're going to do with our player of the year award don't want to give one out anymore sulking but um that's a debate we can have shortly first of all Firpo Cock, Aronson and Bamford were named in the uh, Premier League worst team of the season as put together by Sofa Score. so they rank players out of 10 in much the same way that we do uh, or RTSB Plus members do rather. They do it in a, a much worse way. We ask nice people. Yeah, but they just uh, do who it. Are generous like, enough to it's support a, this uh, it's, it's podcast AI, it's AI, magazine it? by subscribing. AI bots. But I don't know what algorithm. They are. But ours is great people, they're, lovely people. Them is bad machines. Some of the nicest people anybody's ever met. Um, this is uh, I don't know who does this. Sofa score maybe the ask actual Skynet. I think um, it is. It's, it's the computers. Uh, MFI. MFI. They make they make sofas, don't they? Or DFS. <laughs> I don't even know if MFI is still going there. Which is what was MFI? It was like a hardware chain, wasn't it? In the they made furniture and stuff. Yeah. DFS was what in, I was in thinking the nineties. <laughs> anyway, I ain't having it. Right. So they have said Bamford is in there, leading the line with a six point six out of ten average. Furpo at left back six point five five. All similar figures, really, aren't they? Robin Cox six point six three, and Brendan Aronson. Uh, 6.51 out of 10 average over the season. And the right back? Uh, Adam Smith. Ex Leeds. Is that the same one? Yeah. Yeah. On the guy low. from the Institute. There's a very and strong anti Leeds bias. Bobby Dick or Dover Reed. I'm quite surprised well. how Bobby Dick or Dover Reed has ended up in here because Fulham finished, where were they in the Premier League? Fine, weren't they? Middle. In the yeah, middle. Yeah, they were in the middle of the Premier League. They finished 10th. He scored, um, so yeah, so first of all, being in a team that finished 10th, he can't be that bad. He scored four goals, one assist. Um, so he's not, you know, set anything, uh, not really put the Premier League on flames, but he can't, how can you be in, I feel a little bit bad for him. <laughs> like, <laughs> not what, for any of our players, though. What's Bobby Deckel? Well, our players got relegated and they were rubbish, yes, so. whereas I suppose the fact that... Um, Langlet is in here as well from Tottenham. Good I mean, pronunciation. It's yeah. a, it's an indication of like, you know, is is he really the worst defender? And I suppose yeah, he's pretty bad. Well, you've got you've got two Saints in there as well, Bazunu and uh, Elianusi. Where, where, what's missing? Somebody going marching in, a Leicester player. Correct. Yeah, yeah so so Leicester went it. down. They're not there. Yeah, but Je- Le- Bobby Decaldova Reed, he can stand down, go and have a nice. Enjoy the summer. Stick James Madison in there. Yeah. I'm or gl- Harvey Barnes. I'm glad they went. Those Specifically, those two went down. Harvey Barnes for doing the dirty on us when he didn't come in on loan. And Victor Otter smashed his phone. Constantly scoring against us. Yeah. And even scoring on the final day to contribute mm. to sending us down. Yes. Uh, and James Madison for being a little weirdo and shushing the South Stand as well. He's just a bit yeah. of a weirdo, isn't he? I, I don't know. I'm being really petty and taking cheap shots. No, at him, it's isn't? absolutely fine. They should... Both be in the team of the year, and then um, Bobby Deckel Dova Reed. Um, we'll we'll have the joys of the old uh, red button. It's not even the red button. What is in the AFL? It's three years out, and I've completely forgotten. I follow. I to... follow. Yeah, it was the I follow commentators who were calling him Bobby Deckel Dova Reed. I like him. He's a good we, lad. We've not given um, Brendan full credit here. He is the worst player in that team. Not only is he in the team, he's the worst player in it. Yeah, the the, um, the headlines the around this were the worst player in the Premier League statistically, weren't they? Which felt a little bit unfair. Poor young man. I mean, I've got I don't know why I've got a lot of sympathy for Brendan Aronson, just from a, a human point of view. That you know, new country is a young man finding his way, thrust in with a lot of expectation on his shoulders, big price tag. Um, 
and he wilted, <laughs> yeah. basically, as time went on. Started brightly, but it seemed like it was all a bit too much for him as the season went on. It's not his fault that Matthias Click wasn't still here to start playing instead of him, was it? No. Which would have been the sensible thing to do. You give him the start of the season and then see how he goes. Um, he's he's about the same age as Joe Gelhart, isn't he? So um, I don't know what the Austrian league um, is supposed to have given him in terms of development that's better than what uh, Joffy's necessarily had so far. But one of them uh, told to just go and, you know, see if he can help Sunderland out for a while um, and was playing injured, according to their sporting director. Apparently he, he really toughed it through and so got something from that. But then Brendan Aronson is like, no, we are going to put the... Uh, the relegation of a Premier League team on your shoulders. And that's, you know, it tells the story of some of this season. It's not just sentimentality with click, whatever you think about sort of whether he could still have the energy to get around in the Premier League or stuff. He certainly had the experience and the character to take um, a relegation battle in his stride and not look quite as defeated by it as not just Brendan, but a lot of the players look like um, they really just were completely flummoxed by the situation. Whereas, I'm fairly confident um, matches click is a, a little bit more. He's he's older and he's got that great don't give a shit attitude that maybe um, the right kind of don't give a shit attitude that could have been helpful. And if he was in, in this team, weeks. if he was in this team, he'd have just tweeted about it saying that's bollocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I know Aronson has been a, he's felt annoying this season, and you've been wound up with him particularly, Michael, because of the relentless going down and the, the pleading and stuff, which all that stuff you would probably be able to overlook like so much this season. Had we stayed up, had we been better? Um, I mean, he... I started the season saying if he was on the opposition side, he would really annoy me with his pleading face. And I feel like I ended the season saying I'm annoyed he's on my team with his pleading face to the referees because he was just he was just frustrating. He had no, he seemed to have no plan with the ball other than get it and hope he was fouled. I mean, I'm just, I've just got his um, the player ratings up for the season here and Started the season brilliantly. He got an 8.5 against Wolves, 7.7, uh, 07 against Southampton, and then it followed by 9.51 against Chelsea. But uh, amazing start. Like it seemed, it seemed like he was the, in the early stage of the season, it felt like he was the player that almost made sense of Marsh's tactics because with him in there, you went, okay, I can sort of see how this might work. But then I think post World Cup in particular, just completely, completely disappeared. And I don't think he's, I don't think he's contributed at all since the World Cup. Nobody really had seemed to have the ability to to tell him another thing to do. Like his, mm. it was quite swift after the World Cup that Jesse Marsh got sacked and then uh, Grathia's in. And Marsh, I think, because of, he's always had quite a upwardly mobile trajectory. He had that one tough year, tough year um, at Montreal, his first managerial job, when he then went around the world and took some time out and stuff. But apart from that, Red Bulls, successful team and made them more successful. And then um, Salzburg just waltzing the uh, the Austrian Bundesliga every year. Suddenly at the bottom of the league and your tactics aren't working, I don't think Marsh knew what to do. And then he certainly doesn't have anything he can tell Brendan Aronson about what to do in this situation because he doesn't know himself. And then he's gone and then Grathier is coming in and is trying to you know, put things together again. Scoobs has a go. And then Sam Allardyce, I don't think he was interested in him. I don't think he was interested in any of our players who were under the age of about 26, unless he was forced to play them because there was nobody else. So there's that, I think that's part of the hope with Aronson, part of the sympathy and part of the hope is that if we have a proper manager, um, somebody can give him some better ideas of what to do in these situations than just try and win a free kick and try not to look too useless. Somebody's actually gone, no, no I'll teach you how to play football he needs coaching like so many of them they needed coaching didn't they but yeah. once the season is underway and the momentum runs away from you and you're changing coaches all the time uh, it becomes a bit of an issue it looks like it probably won't be our problem anyway next year won't Brendan because there's uh, the stories are already out there put out by, by someone his agent or someone inside Leeds trying to draw up interest but it feels like someone is trying to get out there that yes he does have a relegation release clause if anyone would like to meet it please email the, uh, the 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 and I'll ring the number at the bottom of this advert. It's that kind of a thing. It's like, uh, yeah, I feel, I feel like it's probably for the best if he leaves in summer. Yeah, you wonder if that was maybe just a bit United States led, really. And I don't think he stands out as the exception when it comes to relegation release clauses. Bit of a, possibly a bit of a non-story. 
I don't know. Um, it's impossible to say. I mean, there's part of, I mean, are we going to do the, are we, are we interested in who stays and who goes? Because it feels so, uh, like so much like anything could happen. So Aronson's got a release clause. He might want to stay. Somebody might pay the release clause. 10 clubs might pay it. And then, you know, there's a bidding war and another player won't go. It all just is too confusing at this point. I almost want, and it almost might be beneficial because I was, again, listening to Phil Hayes' Monday Club and he started talking to you about um, uh, like recruitment structures and putting in place um, like strategies and filling in place. And we were told about it on the, the other half of this show as well. And a lot of that stuff actually, you know, I didn't become a football fan to think about staffing a recruitment structure um, behind the scenes of a football club. There's part of me wants to just, all right, season's ended forget about football for a few months. You people who run the football club, sign some better players, sell the ones you don't want, don't sell the ones I like, and then I'll see you in August, and then we start again. But there's a lot of kind of um, re recruiting to uh, to staff um, behind like admin structures. It's like, I don't actually give a shit. It's not my problem. It's Angus Kinnear's problem. But it's felt like it's become and our it, problem because uh, we saw the glaring holes in the existing recruitment policies yeah. didn't we you so know? it's almost like we'll, we'll come back in august and then if you haven't done a good job then i'll tell them but at the moment it's kind of like who uh who do we keep who do we buy do, do you uh, think do like sell? do you think like video games stuff like fifa stuff like football manager has made this stuff more uh more in people's minds than perhaps it would be otherwise because yes. everybody gets to to play recruitment everyone gets yes. to do it and from the whole thing the whole thing and stats as well I think contributes to a. I've been meaning to write this down at some point. And I've not got around to it, but you've said it now. You don't need to. Just because, like, because technically, it's something's moved in the way that players and football clubs and fans interact. Where it's not that they play for you anymore. It's like they work for you, um, and you and people put themselves in the position of being their boss and think in terms of like, you know, this basically what these ratings are. It's like a, it's a performance review, isn't it? It's like staff performance review and you're sitting down and going like, well, you didn't meet, I've got your, I've got your running statistics here and your expected, expected goals are a great example of it. You didn't meet your key performance indicators for the season. Um, and I'm very angry about it. And people, when they're talking about football online, they use lines, uh, things like gross negligence and, um, well, the Arsenal fans used war crimes. Well, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> that's uh, military metaphors have always kind of been there, but um, business metaphors and workplace metaphors are a different thing. Where and that's essentially what a lot of this expected goals in particular is is talking about people, employees underperforming relative to their expected statistical outputs. And to me, that's not really a fun way of looking at football. I like, and I will always appreciate Jackie Harrison is the perfect example of both sides of this. His, and he was even doing it in the midst of going down on uh, Sunday. His first touch is phenomenal. The, the, the way he can control the football is just beautiful. And I love watching it just as a, as a Leeds fan, because he's playing for my team and just somebody who likes watching football. Let's do cool stuff. But then that gets set against. It's like, well, but oh, but his his crossing output is is this and that, and it's kind of like, well, I'm not his boss. Yeah, it's what it is. Is it? It's reducing what we like to consider as an art form down to maths, isn't it? It's like it's like I don't know how to use that. It's a clunky analogy. But, also, but going, going into the Mona Lisa and starting to measure things, you know, like measuring the distance between her brow and her chin, and it's not only maths, but it's also about what you get out of football as well, which is kind of like this expectation of them meeting a minimum uh, performance. It's like um, a season ticket or or watching them on, on television means there's a, a minimum service agreement has been in place and the players have failed to fulfil their contractual obligations by not... To you. Yes, to me personally, uh, by not uh, putting in enough crosses per 90 minutes across the season. And th that's not sport. That's the language of business. And it's kind of, and it does, and and you will never be happy from that because they'll they'll never be able to live up to that because there's only one team can win the league, um, and if you go into the expectations that you know the players have to make you happy in this in this way, 
because you are their boss, they're always going to let you down. And so you're always going to be angry about them not achieving X and Y and, and doing this. And it, it well, becomes... well, let's let's apply that example then, because there's a very front and centre one here, Patrick Bamford, who is in this worst team of the season lineup and his role in our downfall, if you want to bill it as dramatically as that. And people are going to go away from this season remembering the missed chances, the missed penalties and stuff like that. And he's in this team, I would dare say, on the basis of missed opportunities because I think he's, the going back to stats, he's the um, the biggest underperformer on XG, isn't he, in the entire league, which is why which is why he's here, missing chances. Um, it's something we've always known is part and parcel of what you get with Bamford. Um, we, I know we took some pelters, and I know he didn't like it himself when he, we were criticising or taking the piss out of him in the promotion and well in the last championship stint should we say uh and he and we and he was part of the thing that got us promoted which meant he banked a lot of credit he came up he had a good season in the premier league but then he kind of reverted to type albeit through the prism of lots of injuries so where do we stand on bamford in relation to this and his place in this team um i was getting criticized this week for being uh, constantly too nice about him yeah that is, that is another thing that's flicked over now i was um some some one defending Western McKenney, I think, ended up having to go at me saying, "No, you, you don't. You never criticise Bamford." It's like, well, if, I think if you go back and listen, we've been criticising Bamford for for a lot longer than you've been watching Leeds games. So, this this has been a thing for like five years. Is it five years now? Yeah, I, I, I was amazed. Somebody's like, "Well, oh, he would say that. He's always saying good things about Pat Bamford." <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> It's like context is quite true. It's like context is quite important, isn't it? And yeah. you look at what's happened in history, and we've we've got a five year sample size now with Bamford, where we know he's profligate in front of goal, and Christ, he frustrates the mm. the hell out of me. But I'm used to it. We've yeah, we've also seen his output in terms of running. And for me, if you're going to succeed in the Premier League and cement yourself in there, you need somebody who can do the running and also can finish. I think if you're going to be cold hearted about it, we need better than Patrick Bamford. But in terms of what we've actually seen, we've been shit without him a lot of the time and we're better with him in the team, even though he misses a load of chances, which has cost us. It partly comes back to people like Ailing as well when you can make an, you can certainly make an argument to say we need someone better than this. But equally, it's not the fault of Bamford that we haven't bought anyone better than him mm. and therefore we're still relying on him. It's not, I mean, like Luke Ailing, we tried to replace him and then it turned out his replacement was worse than he was. So he ends up back in the team and it's not, it's not the fault of those players that the club have done that. So they are, they are then put out there to play. And I'm sure Bamford doesn't deliberately miss hit a penalty. I'm sure he doesn't deliberately miss hit a shot at the far post. Like these are simple things that he'll do every day in training. And I'm sure he does them easily, but for whatever reason, he, he was not able to do it. But again, not his fault. Like I've, I've never got the impression with Bamford, he doesn't try. It's just that particularly in the last couple of years, he has never looked fit. Like he, the old the running style and everything and touch, it's just all looked wrong for as long as I can remember now. So That's kind of where the context comes in because when we were uh, very critical of Bamford was in the promotion season when he was um, fully fit because his first season he did his ACL twice. I think didn't he? And they said that his knee, the first one, his knee, it was like he'd been run over. Um, it was that bad an injury. But then the promotion year when it was him or Enketia up front, and then we had to sign Jean Kevin Kev Augustin because he just wasn't putting these chances away. And there was really, there was kind of, and there was so much on the line of us trying to get promoted after so long. Um, then it just became really annoying watching him put chance after chance um, not in the goal. And so you got mad about it. But then, um, then he had a lot of goals that season that actually, in the end, held us up. And then a lot of goals the season after that got us to ninth in the Premier League. And then since then, He's just, whatever has been wrong with his legs has just been constant. And there's kind of, um, everything he's done in the last two seasons, he kind of set against, it's like, well, I mean, your plantar fascia is all over the place at the moment, isn't it? In, <laughs> in all kinds of bits and pieces. And you're watching him um, crying on the bench at Wolves. And he's just never got to a point where that's been fixed. See, we've not seen him anywhere near his best for two seasons. And, it's unsurprising in that context that he's been rubbish um, compared to his best. And the problem as we've gone on is that, yeah, somebody should have bought another footballer that could do those things um, while he, so that he didn't have to basically. Um, and yeah, who knows what will become of him next season. He's a really hard one to, to call in that sense because he could 
be the promotion season Bamford again, fully fit, frustrating as fuck, um, but score loads of goals. Or it could be another season where his legs just don't work. And um, and then with it being a short summer as well, it's like it's only you know two months before the season starts again, six weeks to pre-season and stuff. So, you know, the, the story as well of going through COVID, World Cup, the scheduling of it all, there haven't been a break at all. And there still isn't one. There's, there is not a period of time where you can say, Pat Bamford, go away, get fit. Don't even think about playing football until you are not even just 100% fit, but you've been 100% fit for a period of time. But it's always been um, get him to 60%, send him out, see if he can do something. And then and there's been too much of that. Gets... There's just been too much of it, hasn't there, yeah. overall? Uh, going to the other end of the park with this, and you've got Furpo and Cock there in the um, in the back four. Because Robin Cock is, is a bit of a an enigmatic one, a mercurial one when it comes to this. Furpo seems quite easy in terms of that is just an interesting... He was good for a month. He's just an interesting man, isn't he? I, I've got no axe to grind with Junior Furpo on a personal level. He seems like a nice guy, but um, he's here to play football and it would appear, barring that month, Moscow, that he's not very good. Yeah. Someone did um, Someone did get in touch, actually, to ask. Uh, we saying, you never did do the Furpo mugs then? It's like, no, I don't think we... Um, I don't think we quite trusted him, did we? To, to commit to a, a load of porcelain being produced for him. But, yeah, I think... Um, Cox the interesting one because he, I sort of feel like he's not had a terrible season. But then I don't know if it's just the style of defender is that he doesn't. He almost doesn't want to make himself look stupid. It feels like if you look at someone like Rasmus Christensen defending, it feels like for all his limitations, he's not afraid to make himself look like an idiot. So therefore, he spends an awful lot of time throwing himself on the ground and like chasing stuff that he maybe is a bit of a lost cause and stuff, and that adds to a, a slightly frantic frazzled looking footballer whereas cock is i don't know he feels like he's quite in his head at least he's he's like a, a calm ball playing defender but then a lot of stuff just probably goes straight past him which he should maybe try and stop i mean maybe we've been a bit unfair to the defense in the sense that we've talked about players like aronson needing coaching to get the best out of him you could say the same of the defense couldn't you but then you can't help but look at the goals conceded and it's more than two per game um, and, and that probably applies for the last two seasons, doesn't it, there or thereabouts? Well, yeah, the, the changes in tactics never really sorted out the defence. It was always the thing with the last days of um, Bielsa. So Bielsa's football worked. We were incredible defensively in the championship because we never let anybody else have a touch. I used to count how long it took opposition teams to have a touch of the ball in our penalty area. And we go from kickoff. 20 minutes 25 minutes and they're not even being near our goalkeeper so the idea that Bielsa's teams can't defend was never really worked but um, out of possession it was more difficult and that's the thing the championship we were able to keep the ball all the time and then against teams in the Premier League in the second season they had the ball more often and then you saw that the defensive structure um, wasn't good as Eki would say against Ball that's never been solved because we moved from that to Jesse Marsh attacking we out ball. We went from being a possession-based team to a team where the coach would say, if you can't think of anything better to do in the final third, give them the ball and then tackle them. We were all about tackling and dribbling. Um, and that's also why now nobody in our midfield can pass because we didn't buy players who can dictate games. We bought players who can react to situations and who can dribble in the final third. So we've got wingers everywhere, but nobody who can put a foot on the ball and control the game. And a defence that is still weak, out of possession, only now, instead of having a manager in Bielsa who tried to keep possession so that, that wouldn't be a problem, we had a manager who played without possession, making it an even bigger problem. And then Gracia and Allardyce came in and they did their best to sort of try... Well, Gracia did his best to try and find some balance but obviously was falling apart because we don't, we just can't be a calm team in that sense because there isn't that player to just slow things down and think and create. And then Allardyce in the end, um, I think showed that he's 10 years out of date. Yeah, I was going to say this leads us on a bit to Allardyce, doesn't it? The different coaching styles and on the playing side, he's factored into that. Not for me next season, don't know about you. No. Is that, the end, of, is that it, the end of that discussion? I hope so. <laughs> if he'd actually kept us up and 
like if, if he'd come in and won two out of these four games, I actually could have seen an argument for saying, all right, well, give him a season in the Premier League. Let's have a really boring season of shit football and finish 14th. I could have seen an argument for it then. The fact we've gone down without winning a game, 100%. I mean, the, pro- the problem with aiming for 14th there, Michael, is that we would have been milling around in the bottom third for a lot of it and everyone would have lost the shit because we would have been doing the same again and it would have completely eaten up the players probably. And I, I think with regards to the defence, I think that's one of the key problems. We've got a team of pussies, to be perfectly honest. I think we're too, we're too soft. Um, you haven't yeah. got any absolute bastards in there who have just got that innate desire to win and potentially even hurt people sometimes. What can we do to Pascal Strauch over summer to make him angry? I don't know that we can. I don't know. I don't think you can. Can you he's a teach, lovely boy. Can you coach the dog into players? That's the thing. Well, Brad is retired, hasn't he? Mm. Get him back. Spend get him back spending a summer with uh, with Strauk, trying to channel some anger. We need to, we need to sign of um I don't know what I don't know what's wrong with him, with Strauk. He just he, he feels like he's got it all there for him in terms of he can play foot he's got he can play really nice passes, he's fit he's big, like he should be a physical defender. But in the end, he ends up being less physical than someone like Berardi, who is like eight inches smaller than him or something. It it, it feels weird that he's easy to play against physically and it feels like that with a few of our players as well like I, I feel like Cork maybe slightly falls into that as well for the size of him I don't feel like he dominates games necessarily yeah he's a bit featherweight isn't he when it comes to like physicality against I mean the other, the other I'm thinking the defense, of, you know crosses and stuff like that corners or whatever I was going to say the other thing with the defence I'm just, I'm just looking at the appearance that's Cock started 36 games but then you look down the list of who started other games and you're down to Strout 26 but half of those are at left back couple of ones at centre back ailing then 22 again split between right back and um right back and centre back Christensen 21 split between right back centre back you've got Verber and Cooper playing 14 and 16 so there's and then Furpo on 14 as well so there's not any consistency there and even the players who pl- it well yeah I've forgotten about him he he went fairly early didn't he? How, how many did he play he not very many January. but we oh, he dropped he dropped him early but he didn't go till January yeah true but yeah it just feels like a it's seven, seven starts he had. So there's just no consistency there at all, is there? Um, and it's not surprising, I guess, from that, that you you fail to ever build a structure. Well, let's turn our attention then to uh, positives, if we can find them, and have a quick chat about the, the player of the year um, data, which we, we sort of started running with this uh, um, at the start of the season, just as a bit of a whimsical thing. And it's actually been really interesting to to chart this. And we have handed it over to, is it a nuclear physicist who got in touch, Michael, or something? Uh, some something like that. Some yeah. galaxy brain who who's really good with numbers, like and they sent through like some graphs about um, finishing positions. And I looked at it and I went, "Wow, that's nice." It's a, I like his his graph is done for finishing positions. It's like a little where you need to finish how many points you get for each position in the Premier League, and a little a little wave with what what is the kind of average and stuff. It's, yeah. It's so nice. like if if you finish in seventeenth, this is the range of points that teams have historically got. Is what we're basically saying. Yeah. And yeah, so we, we gonna... were shit, weren't we? <laughs> He's going to go and we'll look at our data and try and draw something more from it than um, the players who didn't play at the end of the season <laughs> did better than those who played. Because it it has been, and so what we've been doing is with each uh, with each game we've asked our TSP Plus members, so it's a good nice big sample size to score players out of ten, and and you know a lot of it's led by emotional reaction to games, isn't it? How you feel, like so we beat Chelsea, people are scoring seven, eights, nines, tens, and stuff like that. Uh, and that was was that Jesse Marsh's high point that that one? Yeah, but I think it's still the season's best managerial performance. I think you got like nearly nine out of ten or something. And uh, are we publishing all these in? Are we doing a summer special this year? We are doing some special. So, so yeah, there'll be some. Uh, rank, there'll be the slight differences in how. This is probably why it's good. Uh, is our nuclear nuclear friend <laughs> getting like which games were voted in because? He's got the full data set, right? Yeah. But I mean, I d- like there's three different full data sets because I never include the League Cup games when I'm doing roundups for the um, mag and stuff. But whereas here, it's like uh, which one? Melier playing 37 games in a 36 um, uh, game scene. So there are differences straight away. Um, but yeah, so it's fine. Right, so essentially what's happened is, so the range of numbers is um, 4.39 out of 10. Guess who that is? It's our friend, isn't it? Yeah. Legion, friend of Legion United, he'll always be welcome back, him and his dad. Yeah. 
Weston well, McKinney. Weston McKinney's scored lowest on this. Uh, and he came in at a time uh, later in the season when the stress had all got a bit too much. Because most of the higher marks in this were banked early season before the season spiralled out of control. And essentially, the, the headline news here is that Tyler Adams is the highest scoring based on 26 games. And he's come out with 6.73 out of 10. But then dropping down through the next couple of positions, you've got Daniel James, who's next with only five games, but an average of 6.4. Clicky, um, just a fraction behind, 15 games. So that's a fairly big sample size, isn't it? It's not a million miles away not, from... Not many minutes, though. Mm. No, this is true. That's the key thing. So maybe this is what our nuclear physicist friend needs to do is work it out per minutes played, something like that. If that... I, I once tried doing that, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Moscow, <laughs> given that you struggle with basic maths when we've been on the pod, I think maybe he's the man to do it rather than you. No offence, you're really good with no, writing. That's, that's you're really was... good with writing. Stick to the writing. Making sure he's got all this, like he's got the right numbers. So and then make it make sense. Finishing fourth was Ilan Melier, who I think, again, the first half of the season performances um, banked him that high position because he kind of went off the boil later on didn't he and then Willie Nonto you're down to Verba but then you're into the realms of Perkins Sinistera Jackie about a third of the way down the, the field with 5.73 out of 10 and, and it kind of goes down from there so what what do we make of this because Tyler Adams is the winner if we stick to the original rules um, I want to give it to Dan James <laughs> I was saying earlier in the season it was like it was going to be Willie Nonto's trophy one way or another just because I really wanted to meet Willie Nonto because he struck me as a nice lad. Am I allowed to do that? Are we allowed to give him some sort of award? Young player of the year, could we maybe? If you want to meet Willie Nonto, we'll just need to find just a way of finding out arranging where he, that. Where yeah. he lives. Seems like simpler than... Um, he would probably be happier with the interaction if he didn't have to go away with a memento. <laughs> So I think we can nice, work on that. One of those nice little trophies we could get one made up, you know, of the maybe we could get like a darts player one, you know, like those gold trophies on top of the column. You could give him a bust of you. I don't think he'd want. So he'd that. always remember you by that, and it would stay in his house forever. Uh, so where where do we sit on this? What what do we want to do with it? Because officially, Dan James has got the silver medal. Well, that's I mean, it, he's, mate. he's coming back, isn't he? He's still our player. Fulham are not having him, so. Welcome back. I think he'll be good in the championship, assuming we keep him. I think he'll be perfectly adequate in it. Perfect. Is that is that, uh, damned by faint praise, I think, there, Michael. Because I would like, actually, I'd like to throw this open then to members. What do we do with it? So, numbers wise, Tyler Adams wins it. And also, I suppose, who do you feel it was? Because, yeah. you know, you might, you might think it actually was Rodrigo, who I think is about 10th on this list despite all of his goals, which is kind of unusual because you'd, you know, we've just been discussing Robin Cock, who was the statistically the worst defender in the, in the league. And he is not point, not two behind Rodrigo in this, who was our top goal scorer and plays pretty well. Yeah. Phil's given him player of the season, hasn't he? Over on the athletic. And no, Rod- nothing that guy. Well, Rodrigo. So the sample size is 33 games and a season average of 5.71 out of 10. So he kind of, he's gone from some big highs to fairly low lows. But um, is all you want from a striker to just bang goals in? That's probably what people wanted from Jorginho Ruta, and that's why he is second bottom with uh, with four point six one, unfortunately. Yeah. So the um the median average here is the median, the mode, one of them. I don't know. This is why we need the nuclear physicist. Anyway, forty two games and an average of five point five two out of ten is the game average, which is probably reflective of the season. Um, any, any outliers in this data that you think are kind of wrong? I feel a bit sorry for Matteo Joseph being near the bottom at 5.12. I, think, I feel like his four appearances have not been enough chance for him. And I am entirely pinning my hopes on him next season as our main striker. So no pressure at all. Right. So then we'll, we'll throw this back to our members who have the link for SpeakPipe, which is where you leave us a voice note. You tell us, what do you feel about player of the year? Who's your player of the year? And do we crown Tyler Adams based on... Um, the data that we've got. It looks Based like we should. him winning it. It looks like because he's won it. I mean, it's, our, it's our competition. We could do what we want. True, true. Uh, so basically, it's, do we respect the uh, ratings that you've been contributing all season or do we just make something up? Uh, yeah, like, and give something to Mateus Click because he's quite cool. Mm. Fine. Let's move on to um, Manager of the Year. This is interesting. Scoobs. Oh. So Scoobs does come out with the, the highest season average, which is probably based on the, the draw at Old Trafford, I dare say. But three, ga- three games and an average it's of... It's not six- based on Everton, that's for sure. No, it's three games and a, a season average of 6.48 out of 10. I would actually um, like to... He should have got a higher rating. 
if we'd been rating staff contributions. At West Ham, he was wearing a baseball cap. He looked really cool. I really liked him in a baseball cap. So I would, um, if there was any kind of like closeness about, you know, whether we were giving it to him or um, another manager, I would give it scoops on the strength of his baseball cap. Michael, you're a bald of head. Where do you sit on hats? Um, I, I do need to wear one in it won't, summer. It won't change his appearance if he sits on it. No, I'm saying, I, I can't imagine Michael in a baseball cap. That's always what I'm saying. It's not, not the sort of done thing over a certain age, is it? Or is it? Well, yeah, Scoops no, is it, a certain age, isn't he? That's what, well, that's what I'm getting at. Do, do middle-aged men, should they wear baseball caps? Uh, just just one second. I'm fearing I what's, mean, The, the what's evidence of Michael now. Scabala... He's going to come back with it on sideways, isn't he? Or backwards. Who is 40 is yes. Hey, it looks all right. Yeah, there's sort of a, a loose crime watch vibe about it. There you go. This is just because I've. This is in my my pile of stuff here for the walk. But it's because I get a sunburnt head. Yeah. But you, you can't be you can't be taking chances to these things. No. But yeah, I admit I do look a bit um, horrible. <laughs> I'll, I'll try it with a hood up. That'll take the edge off it. But, yeah, you, yeah, you look like you've been out robbing grannies. To be honest, there. Try yeah. putting the hat over the hoodie. I mean, this is great audio, by the okay. way, for anyone yeah. who's just listening to this. All I said was, Michael Scabala looks great in a baseball cap. Now, I don't know why we're dressing Michael like some kind of <laughs> twisted Ken doll. <laughs> the hair ripped off by, chewed off by a dog. Yeah, that looks all go. right, that's good. Um, At least I'm not to dress as a Smurf. Think of the positives. It could have been yeah. a little white hat that I was wearing today, couldn't it? But sadly not. So the, the manager of the year data, Sam Allardyce, four games, has ended up with a season average of under four. 3.97 out of 10 which is, is lower than I expected, actually. He sucked. But it, it reflects on how bad the season was overall. And how it? bad he was. I've, I've lost patience with Allardyce in the end. It was He talked a good game all along, but um, the results, and that lineup against Spurs, six defenders, and then watching him um, while Carl Robinson's desperately trying to interest somebody in his notepad about substitutions, and just standing there shrugging and then I can't remember if it was before the game or after the game um, against Tottenham but it, one of the interviews he was going on about again about how um, football's a simple game and all all this stuff about passing out from the back you know that's the stats show you that football's an easier game than that well, what's, the, well, what's the name of his podcast? No Tippy Tappy Football isn't it and what you got to bear in mind about Sam Allardyce and so yeah so the finish, talking a good game um but there was lots of things where he's like, "Well, I was telling them all week not to die, like, to stay on the feet in the penalty area." Well, if you told them all, if you're really, if you're that good as a manager, then why did we give away penalties from people not doing it? It's all very well you sitting there saying, "I told them not to do that," but isn't part of the job then to make them sure that they they don't do that rather than, "Well, I told them." It's very Lampardish. And then the other thing was the the penalties it was like, "Oh, I just left that how it was." He he he's saying. On the one hand, that like, oh, we left no stone unturned, no detail left to chances. We tried, we fought to keep Leeds in the Premier League, um, but I didn't bother like interfering in who took, takes the penalties. I yeah, with, I with the, with the emphasis that. on set pieces, that is wild, isn't it? Until afterwards, yeah. once it once it had been missed, and he's like, oh yeah, that one has to do with me. <laughs> but the thing, but you got to remember about Sam Allardyce in general is that all the teams at the Premier League, at the top of the Premier League, and you see the way Brighton have shot up there this season it's all possession based it's all about taking risks in possession and um, playing that way and he describes that style of football as a consequence of brainwashing he says that you've been brainwashed into thinking that's good so Manchester City could win the treble this year brainwashing if you think that style of football is successful and good well you can, ig- you can ignore them because of the financial doping aspect of it and the fact that they've got more money than anyone else but Brighton, got Brighton then. then yeah Arsenal then. Yeah. Every good team anywhere that is playing Whitball, um, Sam Allardyce regards this as tippy-tappy nonsense. It's a simple game. Playing out from the back's a load of brainwashed nonsense. It's all rubbish. Um, and, you know, he is not somebody who we should be letting either manage the club next season or... I've got... He kept... He started... Because it's not only him saying, like, oh, we'll have to... I'll be talking to him about if I'm going to... Uh, stay on in football that's going to be here he's also been dropping in like oh you know Carl Robinson was really hard done by at Oxford and the people don't realise what a good coach Carl Robinson is I don't think Carl Robinson could be he could do a great job for a team in the championship another team maybe because I don't need 
I don't need Carl Robinson being our new manager with Sam Allardyce as some kind of consultant down the phone <laughs> getting another big payday off of Leeds for doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah right. Um, Javi Gracia uh, was the third place when it came to manager of the season with 4.8 out of 10 average on his 12 games. Who, I'm not, what was he trying to achieve? I don't really know. Um, then Jesse Marsh has outscored him with his 22 games with 4.85 out of 10. Basically, the, the one Chelsea thing that strikes game. me from this list is that essentially I didn't want any of these people to be managing Leeds United. <laughs> and that here we are, we've had four of them this season, not a single one of them uh, would I have chosen. Well, but... the, cl- the closest we came to competency was Javi Gracia for a bit, wasn't it? For a few games. Yeah. Then it seemed, it seemed like his original idea was fine. But then when that stopped working, he kind of went, I don't know. Yeah, there was there was never the... Um, dice. Well, that was it. It seems like they veered towards somebody who's got some sort of shouty aspects to their personality who would, would be seen as a motivator or whatever. Um, vibes, funnily enough. Grathia's aim in the end was kind of trying to... It was attackers attacking some midfielders in the middle and then defenders defending. That was the thing. You, you didn't see, um, like... Luke Ayling overlapping as much as he did in it's like Furpo strangely looked quite competent in it. But there was a little bit more of an attempt to just let's line up properly and be a bit more structured to this, but it quickly I think it fell apart, um consequence of the, the lack of confidence by that point in anything they were doing and then also, as we touched on before, the lack of sort of somebody to control a football match. That's kind of I mean the the mystery of um the Crystal Palace halftime, I think this, the simple explanation is that Roy Hodgson just pointed out that we're crap and that if they'd played like that from the start, they probably just would have won 3-0 yeah. if they'd played the way they did in the second half because there's not there wasn't a player um, in our squad who could control or dictate the tempo of a game and could uh, stand in the middle and go, right, we're, we're just going to slow down. We're, we're a goal up. Let's see it out to half time. We slowed. I'm just going to play some passes over here. This is what we're doing. It was, and uh, without that, Gracia's attempt to try and find this, this balance and this control um, was kind of doomed, really. And then, yeah, mm. the only solution was um, Sam Allardyce. Well, he can try shouting at them. <laughs> <laughs> Who next then? The lack of a plan, Whitball, was essentially our downfall. I think this season because we did the the points drop from winning positions and all that sort of stuff. It becomes almost inevitable when you've. You you can't have five minutes in a game where you go fine. We're just going to have a little break here. Just need to we just need to keep hold of it. We we'll just pass it around. Just see out this next little period when you when your only plan is pump it forwards, and that's what you spent all preseason doing. Then all three give, preseasons. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah, just do more of the same. The plan does work. You just need to have more faith in it. Was the was obviously Marsh's kind of building block of it, wasn't it? So I, it's it was it was. Not surprising, I guess, that no one else could turn it around it at was, that point. It was Bielsa's building block as well. I think people will immediately point that out that his plan was the plan's right. You just have to put more work into it. But then it's that follow on of going from uh, a style of football that was so intent on keeping the ball and dominating possession as far as you could, which was more difficult with the players that we had in the Premier League against the other teams in the Premier League. But we were um, making a decent fist of it apart from when we came up against the the top six teams in the second season, to a manager who was completely just don't have the ball. Um, And that is the change that I think it really confuses. And it's, you know, following on from Bielsa, and you've seen people still saying, well, they they failed to recover from what Bielsa did to them, the success that he he brought um, somehow. But there's nothing about what Marcelo Bielsa did did to Leeds or does to a team that makes it impossible for somebody else to go in there and keep them being decent or even improve them. And the great example is probably Brighton, where they went from Graham Potter, who left. It wasn't even their choice. They didn't sack him. He went, he walked out on them, and they immediately went and got um, a manager who played the same sort of overall style of possession-based football, but even more so. So it was kind of like really... And when you read about De Zerbi up to that point, it just makes it makes perfect sense that he would follow that style of football because it's essentially it built on the strengths of all the players that they had. Whereas, and you could see with the the changes that we had to make to accommodate Jesse Marsh's team, where it's like Tyler Adams, Rocker, Aronson, 
um, all coming in. We went from, uh, there isn't a, a player among them who is creative or can unlock a defence um, with some thought or with a, an idea. It's all just kind of get it get it to the fast dribbling attackers and run at the goal frame in the centre of the pitch, um, which was such a change, such a stark difference from the way Bielsa played that it just makes the whole idea that Marsh was the right person to follow him look more and more insane. We needed a coach who would build on the strengths of the players that we had and the style of football that they had been playing and change it into something new rather than this. That was also a big failure, wasn't it? Apart from the transfers, it was the the not understanding the importance of possession in yeah. the modern game and it thinking seems... that, that just the running was the, the transferable skill that would, would see us yeah. fine. It all seemed to just come down to pressing stats and running. Yeah. And there was so much more to Bielsa's, um, what Bielsa built than than that. And it would be the same trying to go from any manager. Like it, it was the whole point of having a director of football at any club is that you have this style of play that you then find a manager to keep doing it if that yeah. one isn't working. For some reason, that's just completely gone by the by. That's what essentially found him out in the end, wasn't it? I think that was the thing that hugely exposed him and then the, the things that sort of spiralled out of control from that. I mean, Especially given it was planned for two years. Well, yeah. Talking to Jesse about it. And thinking, and as well we saw from other stories emerged of, of um, how Orta has left Leeds, um, continuing to double down on managers such as Marsh, Gracia, right until the bitter end. And if that's your character, then fine. Um, but ultimately it will cost you, on it? Because they proved to be the wrong decisions because we we are where we are. And well, this is the next question, isn't it? What next in terms of manager? And I guess the question of sporting director feeds into that as well. So so where now? Here in Scott, apparently, who um, is, is it Borough at the moment. He's only relatively recently went there. So um, he's been there for recruiting Carrick and he was at Norwich, I guess, when they had Farker, which is an interesting prospect. How would that have sounded? <laughs> Very nice, yes, of course. <laughs> so let's hope we don't get Farker because I can't be doing that for a, a full a, a full season. Almost um, worth it. So the, I mean, the, the two names being linked are uh, him at the moment, and then um, a guy from um, Moscow. I'll go over to you for the pronunciation. Is this the guy from Genk? Oh, you just going Genk? I thought you'd have had a I thought you'd have had a more full oh, pronunciation than oh. that. <laughs> oh. I think I really do anything with Genk. It's Genk. Genk's oh. Genk. Fair enough. Is this uh, Dimitri uh, de Condé? It's just, it's just down the road from Ghent. Ghent and Genk, very Indeed. similar places. In the there's barely a, a consonant between them. He's a he's a funny looking fella, isn't he? If you go back, uh, and I don't know who's put these on our prep sheet, but pictures of uh, of Dimitri Decond, uh, Decond, Deconde, uh from his playing career. He's had a multitude of hairstyles, uh, and there's just something about when he was at his, I guess, his fighting weight when he was playing football that makes him look really, really odd. I think he might be an alien. To be perfectly honest, looking at looking at some of the pictures of him, so I, I'm not sure about him. Although really, he did, go on. He did find some good players at um, at Genk, apparently. But you know, can we trust him? He looks like he's um, really into techno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. Good. You can imagine he might have made a one-off Top of the Pops appearance in in 1992 with a, a song that got to number eight. I hadn't thought um, about the alien thing, Michael, until you mentioned it there, but you're right. Like, you know, Men in Black, how there are aliens basically hiding inside humans' bodies across mm. Earth, and then they reveal themselves to Agent J and so on. He's one of those. He looks relatively normal now, but some of the ones, I think it's the, um, he's gone through stages of, when he's obviously a young man, he's got longer hair, and then he's clung to that while the hair has disappeared around him. So he's gone for like a slicked back, half bald look which has got a bit of Nick, Nicolas Cage about it. And then uh, by the end, he's just shaved it off. And I think that's the better look. He, he's starting to look more normal as he's getting older. Yeah, and he's, he's his, fa his face has filled out as well as he's got older. The classic middle-aged spread. Love it. Um, and it suits him a lot more, doesn't it? He looks like he's grown into his features, if you like. Mm. Do we want either of these guys? A sporting director from Middlesbrough? What could go wrong? <laughs> We are determined not to repeat the mistakes of last year. So what we'll do is, and so on. Um, I don't really mind. What I'd like to just see is a competent structure put in place, whether that's, and Phil keeps mentioning it as well, uh, about maybe they 
they spread the responsibility a little bit more thinly. Maybe there's a head of recruitment, uh, somebody who's a, like a director of football operations, that kind of thing. I mean, Dimitri is wanted by Spurs on Southampton as well, so there seems to be a bit of competition after after the Spurs guy. He was the one who got like a, a worldwide football ban, wasn't he? Which didn't go brilliantly for them. So they need to replace him. Um, but whether or not we can compete with with Spurs, I don't know. It's that chance to build something, isn't it? I know we could never match him on salary, but it's the chance to build something. Um, the chance not to work with Ryan Mason. There is that. There is that. And, and do you think uh, director of football, sporting director, whatever it might be, needs to come before we do manager appointment or do they go in tandem and who do you want to see? Brendan Rodgers is the big name that keeps getting bandied around. If you could make him drop to this division. He's not dropping anywhere. He's unemployed. <laughs> You're doing the uh, the Ken Bates angle. He's, <laughs> he's on the dole. That's what you exactly. argue about with footballers. That you, that you shouldn't have to pay them anything. Offer him 200 if, quid a week. If you don't pay them anything, they, they're all out of work and they'll all be collecting dole checks every fortnight. So um, so they should be grateful for the chance. So that's that should be the, the start of negotiations with... Brendan, it's like phoning him up, say, "Oh, we, we might have an opportunity for you, but we just want to check you're not just down the DHSS today." And uh, if you, if, um, once you've finished signing on this week, come for an interview, and then you can tell them like it's proof that you're seeking work. Brendan will be like, "Oh, this sounds great. Thanks for really uh, bending to my circumstances." Um, I don't know. It's all very complicated, isn't it? Like, who <laughs> can it, we can we just have someone good who's going to get us promoted? It really all depends on what whoever owns the club wants to do um, and how they would like things to work. And because all the moving parts is you could you could get a sporting director and then with a manager in mind, but what if that manager then doesn't like that sporting director? There's normally, one if you have one or the other of them, you've got then a way of testing that, right, this sporting director has hired this manager, so they want to work together, so that's fine. But if you don't have either of them, which one do you, do you hire a manager and then they're like, oh, but I don't like working with any sporting director. I want to pick the players. Or It's all... And then, yeah, when you look at um, other clubs that seem to do these things properly they do have they have like a a sporting director and they have a recruitment director and they have um you know somebody an analyst and they have people working across these teams who do different parts of the job so that it's not all just on the shoulders of um one person and whether that's the way of of doing it and who then ultimately i guess it comes down to who is ultimately making the decisions because the way it seemed to work at Leeds or the way they always said it worked is that Victor Orta is responsible with his scouting team for finding lots and lots of players who will fit what the manager wants and then going to the manager and saying, which one of these do you want? And then looking at him and going, like, really, is this? Is, do I have to choose? And say, <laughs> yes, one of these left backs or no left back at all. It's like, fine, Junior Furpo. Um, and that's the, the process. But then if it's a... Do you then need a director of football to do that? Isn't is that not a, a recruitment director's job of going to the manager and maybe the manager can then say, if if they have the final word anyway, then you have a somebody working on recruitment who helps find the players that they want, and then the director of football role is actually more about making sure that the academy reflects what the first team are doing and make. There's too many parts of it, and the problem is that Leeds have gone from having, uh, are just starting from having none of it and needing it all at the same time. So it's quite difficult to, which one you you feel, and difficult for us to pick a name out of the hat without knowing what they want to do from other, because I could say, like Lee Bowyer would be an obvious choice if Victor Rota was still here, because you know that that's kind of, that marries up, that he'll think, oh yeah, up and coming your manager and I can give him the players that will fit his style of play and impress, but that's that's fine. But then is Lee Bowyer somebody who you would recruit if you're going to have the manager more involved in recruitment? Like, is that is he a transfer wheeler dealer? Um, if not, then is Sam Allardyce going to be the the manager that you would go for if you're not going to have a director? So I don't know what the fuck they're going to do. Call me in August. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, looking down the list, it's mainly you just you kind of look down at it and you go, what? Like Gerard and Allardyce at the top, you think, oh God, please no. Bowyer, I think, no. It's like Scubala's on the list. Colbrand, I think I, I put ten pounds on Colbrand the other week. So he was thirty-three to one, and I, I know Angus Kinnear's got his phone number. Yeah, so that was so, 
So I thought, well, he's, he's probably in with a chance just because of that, because he'd be probably scrolling down his list like, oh, Sam, Sam, okay, I've got him. Alfred Schroeder, he's probably he's probably not going to return my calls anymore. Flicking through it and go, oh, could always ring Carlos, see, see if he fancies it. And if they're giving some, because uh, at the moment, recruitment, there's Andrea Law, the furniture salesman, and then, but there's Craig Dean, who's been doing the recruitment for the academy, seems to be working like across with the scouts who do the senior work. And Carlos Colbran obviously would have worked with Craig Dean when they were both um, at the academy together. So you've got that kind of, there is a relationship there that could work. But then I've watched uh, West Brom playing Sunderland uh, during the run-in to see how Joffy was getting on and also to have a look at Carlos since he turned down our advances and they, oh, they were bloody awful. He, he seemed, he did seem quite annoyed with his own team for most of it. He was constantly telling his goalkeeper to uh, play it short and he kept booting it long and it would cut to Colbran on the sidelines absolutely going crazy and then um, in the last minutes of the game when he'd put Kyle Bartley on as a striker because they were trying to chase um, get into the playoffs at the last ditch attempt now his goalkeeper starts playing it short and he's going absolutely mental at him to play it long so maybe his life and his team would be better if he didn't have a um, obstructive uh, goalkeeper who did the opposite of everything he says <laughs> but I wasn't particularly impressed by West Brom in that game well we'll see how it all plays out that's all we can do isn't it and we will um, come back and uh, and see what's moved it feels like it's going to be a busy summer um, we are going to take a week off next week because there's a charity walk to do um, just a chance to have a little break from Leeds United but of course we will jump on straight afterwards because it feels like stuff is, is about to get, get rolling get moving um, the other part of this is next season we've been talking about next season there has any part of you thought oh, quite looking forward to next season now or are you just like I need to just have have some space and some time away from this one yeah, I'm looking forward to it and I know with the, I've got like a the, the sort of dream scenario of we we recruit well all the young players who've been kind of bubbling under for a year come into the team it'll be really it'd be really nice to get promoted with Charlie Cresswell and Archie Gray in the team and Matteo Joseph banging him in it'd be It'd be fun. Do I believe it will happen like that? Goes back, I mean, to, what, goes back to what we were saying, though, Michael. It doesn't have to be a disaster class every time. No. So why is it? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect place to leave it. Moscow, are you looking forward to it at all, or do you want the break first? Um, I'm probably on the, the same lines. I do look at some of the young players we've got and think it's a chance. They, they could get a chance in the championship that they may not have got in the Premier League, and it's been... Um, you know, you wonder what Jamie Shackleton might have been if he'd been able to force his way into a championship uh, team a few years ago. But then you look at what he did at Millwall and you think, nah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It could be fun. <laughs> <laughs> It'd just be nice. To, I mean, the, the, the I was moaning about there being 46 games. Them being 46 games does mean it's more of a chance that we might win some. Statistically, I just feel like even if we only won the same proportion of games as we won this year, we will win more games because there are more games. Yeah. So we'll see, hopefully we'll see more wins and it would be nice to see Leeds United win a game. Um, that would be good. And I suppose the other, I, I've not for I can't convince myself of this, but with this, this short summer businesses, if you remember when Heckingbottom, like the last few games of Heckingbottom, when we were dreadful in the Wes Houlihan derby away at Norwich and then, QPR at home was just I don't even remember what happened because I was just drinking to get through it I couldn't even watch how bad Leeds had become and then the next season starts and then you know the end of that season we had no idea what was going to happen and somehow we got to August with Bielsa and everything had changed and everything was suddenly beautiful without really overhauling the squad in these massive ways so it is possible you know Bielsa's Bielsa but maybe he's not unique maybe look down the list maybe we'll get Nathan Jones and he will <laughs> transform this club in the space of a month just do whatever it is in pre-season to bring set advice to the ping pong tables that's yep, what he needs to do to bring this squad back and maybe the, all it is is just finding that right person to bring the right vibe to a bunch of players who really as you know as bad as a lot of them have been and we'll see who actually stays should have been better than they were this year um, there were enough kind of decent players in that team that would it looked I feel like that was a mid-table side that got relegated just absolutely just with no idea of what it was doing or 
ability to recover, the ability to do it once they even had a, a whisper of what the idea was. So who stays around um, and who gets added to them and who from the youth team can get involved and then whether um, Alfred Schroeder comes in and proves us all wrong. <laughs> no, no, the headline to take from that is that you think Nathan Jones should take over. Absolutely. He's not even in the betting, is he? Well, get some money on him then. Get some asking for I some think, I think that might be for good reason. We will leave it there. Um, thank you for joining us on this one. We've got a week off next week, but we will pick it all up on the other side of that. Um, still to come this week, though, we have the, the Phil Hayes Show, um, the final one of those before that moves over to us after the break. Join us on that, and otherwise we will see you after a, a well-earned week off. Just, just a week off. We'll see you soon. The Square Ball Podcast. 